This is the City of God podcast, where Christ meets culture. And welcome to the City of God podcast, where we are weekly talking about today's biggest cultural issues all through the lens of God's infallible word. My name is Rob Pacienza, and today I am joined by Jeff Myers, who is the president of Summit Ministries. Jeff, so glad to have you on today. Thanks, Pastor Rob. Looking forward to our show. Uh, You've committed your life, your ministry to proclaiming the whole counsel of God and in particular, really champion this idea that absolute truth is essential uh, for the church and for the next generation to remain steadfast in a culture full of chaos and confusion. Why is the doctrine of God's absolute truth so essential uh, to the church and for us to be grounded in? Rob, I came at this not from a theological perspective, but as a philosopher. And in philosophy, you realize that in order for you to know anything at all, you must assume certain things to be true. What you assume to be true will predict the conclusions that you reach. So everybody in the world is assuming certain things to be true about the nature of the world. And these assumptions flow in patterns. So just like if you want to learn a new board game and be good at it, you learn the patterns of play, you learn the patterns of ideas. The biblical pattern of ideas says everything begins not with the material world, but with the one who made the material world. We start with God, not just with nature. If you just start with nature, then these lives are all we have. If you just start with nature then, and you believe everybody's equal, then if one person has more than somebody else, it's because they stole it and you should have a revolution, right? You always end up with this this worldview that terminates in some kind of self-interested either anarchy or violence. And when I started to think about that and come at it more from the philosophy perspective, I realized if you start with the assumption that scripture is true, that it truly reveals God as he really is, and then you live that out, it not only changes your assumptions in the beginning, it results in an outcome of blessing and flourishing. So I actually sort of worked my way backward. All these amazing things happen in the world, science, art, education, justice, political structures that actually work even though they're chaotic. This is not true in the history of the world unless you start with the idea that truth exists and it's not just a logical proposition, it's Jesus, it's a person. That's so good. Uh, what would what would be some of the indicators that you see in society? As our society moves more towards secularism, what are the things you see that might not be apparent to just the ordinary Christian that's maybe not theologically trained or not super aware of what's happening in society? What are the things that we're seeing, the indicators in society today? Uh, I really think there are three things. The first one is a loss of truth. So you think about truth. Where, where do you find it? When I was growing up, I was taught the goal of education is to seek the truth. Now students are told the goal of education is to speak your truth. Mm. Where does that lead? Well, it leads you to believing that you have no identity aside from the one that you can create for yourself. So you do all the things that you do to your outward appearance to try to establish yourself as unique. You choose your own gender. You know, you do all of these different things to try to establish your identity because there's no way to know who you are outside of yourself if there's no truth. Yep. And if you do that with your identity, then you have no sense of purpose. So 75% of the young adults I work with say they do not have a sense of purpose that gives meaning to their lives. You can see that progression going right off a cliff. And you know where it ends? It doesn't end in self-love. A lot of people think, oh, I'll love myself because I believe in myself. I'm the only thing that there is to believe in. People who end up with that worldview almost always move toward uh, what psychologists call self-derogation. They will say things like, wow, I sometimes I don't think I can do anything good at all. Some things, sometimes I don't even know why I am here on this planet, making derogatory statements about themselves. The antidote to this is to start with God and recognize that is his love for you that accomplish, is accomplished through the work of Christ 
and through you to the rest of the world. It's not about you. It's about you being in the world to be a blessing to the nations of the earth. And when you take on that perspective, uh, unless someone has very serious trauma issues, which they will need to s probably work the therapist to deal with, unless they have that, just having that outward focus changes them. Yeah. Parents listening to this podcast, they have a child going away to college. Um, secular university, and they're going to be challenged, even if they've grown up in the church, uh, they're going to be challenged with uh, this idea that uh, nothing can be absolute, that we can't believe in absolute truth. What is that? What are some simple ways that a, a, a young individual that's grown up in the church can defend the proposition that there is such a thing as absolute truth? Well, the, those are the kinds of students that I want to have come study with me in our programs in Colorado and Georgia yeah, for absolutely. 11 days, because I can bring the, the major thought leaders in philosophy and economics and, and apologetics and so forth who love Jesus to help them find answers to those questions. But I, I, I think it comes down to this. You always want to start by asking the question when you use that term truth, what is it that you mean? Just start by asking a definition because a most, the most common definition among philosophers is truth is what actually is. Okay, how could we establish what actually is? How would we know something exists? One way we can know is there is a difference between facts and opinions. If I say water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level, it might be appropriate for someone to say, well, it depends on the atmospheric conditions, it could be 211 degrees, but it would not be appropriate for them to say, well, just keep your opinions to yourself. Okay, because we know there's a right. difference between fact. a fact and an opinion, yep. right? We know there are historical facts. If I name the date that Martin Luther King was killed in April of 1968, it would not be appropriate for someone to say, well, maybe that's true in your culture, but in my culture, it's different. No, mm. we can establish it through documentary evidence. Yeah. Okay. The question is, are there things that we can know to be true about the world that we can't see or that we can't experiment about? And that's most of what philosophers spend their time thinking about. A lot of them have concluded that you can know that these things actually exist because of the, the nature of the world itself and what it's projecting to us. So, you know, I might look at a car and say, oh, that's a Ferrari sports car. Well, I'm not imposing my morality on anyone. I'm just placing it in a category. Yep. Why would I do that? Because the car actually has an essence that is projected to me. That's so helpful. And anybody yep. in the world can look at that car and if they know what red is and they know the difference between a sports car and another kind yep. of vehicle, they can use that same category. That's evidence that truth is actually knowable. Yeah, that, that's so good. I mean, we live our lives according to absolute truths every day, whether every we realize day, it or not. Right. And it's the reality of absolute truth that leads us and demands that there must be an absolute being, which of course is God. Um, now you wrote a book um, and our television program is called Truths That Transform. And your book is Truth Changes Everything. Yes. And it's a brilliant book because you go through history and you document how Christians, how the church at large has been steadfast historically on this doctrine of absolute truth, and it's been used to shape nations, cultures, and society. Tell us a little bit about what led you to write that book. There was, uh, what led me to write the book Truth Changes Everything was really a, in many ways, a personal crisis. I was diagnosed with cancer. And when you get a diagnosis like that, you don't know what's going to happen. Everything takes on a greater importance. Every phone call might be the last time I get to talk to that person. Every letter might be the last time I get to write to that person. Well, as an author, I'm thinking the same thing. If I only get to write this one last book, what should I write on? Yeah. And I realized all of these, for, for centuries, millennia, people have speculated about, can we know the truth and how would we find it? And the Greeks had a way of approaching it and the Romans had a way of approaching it and the Germans had a way of approaching it, the British had a way of approaching it. But the biblical approach starting in the Gospel of John is that truth exists and it's not just a set of logical propositions. It's not just mathematical formulae through which we model the known universe. It's a person, it's Jesus. John said, in the beginning was the word, and he used this term logos, mm. which the Greeks were, all, they always used that term to try to describe 
the connecting point between what's knowable here and what's unknowable sure. up there. Yep. And he and he said that the, in the beginning was the logos. The logos was with God, and the logos was God. And he goes on to reveal it was Jesus. Yeah. This is the most brilliant philosophical statement ever uttered. That truth does exist, but it's not just whole cold hard facts. Yeah. It's actually personal. And so by it's living, a person. that's right. Yeah. And so by living Christ-like lives, we have the opportunity to demonstrate the truth of that. So that was my big question in the book. How did that change the course of history? And I found out it was people who are Jesus followers who believe Jesus is the truth, who changed the world of science, who changed education, who changed the value of human life, who built medical care, who developed systems of justice that are actually just, because that's very rare in the history of the world and so forth. And all of a sudden I thought, wow, that one single truth changes the world. Yeah. Whether I live or not, that's the message that I want to communicate. Describe for our audience, on, you know, staying on this topic of truth changes everything and particularly having an understanding of history and church history in particular. Uh, describe for our audience, what was the world like that Christianity was born into? Jesus comes into a world full of Roman paganism. What yes. was that world like and what was the culture like and how did the truth of Christianity change everything in that culture in particular? Well, Jesus was born as a Jew, lived as a Jew. He was a Jew. And so you have to sort of look at what was Judaism like at that time. And, and you really want to study the first five books of the Bible, what Jews call the Torah. That is the guide for life. So Jesus grew up in that environment. But it, it, the, the fascinating thing about your question is, they, at the same time, he lived in an area of the world that had been initially conquered by Alexander the Great, who was a Greek. And he, he Greekified, the term they use is Hellenized, to that part of the world. So Greek would have been known by the people who lived there. They would have had some familiarity with Greek philosophy. When the Romans took over, they sort of took the, everything that the Greeks did and they sort of militarized it. Yep. Like, this is all great, but it's not efficient. It's not brutal enough. And so they you, they develop their system. Uh, they did good things, too, like build roads and postal sure. systems and sure. so forth so that the so you could actually have commerce in the world. But that was the world in which Jesus came to minister in this. Yep. Tiny that's like that, little, when we use that phrase Greco-Roman, that's what you just described. Greco-Roman. Yes. Yep. But it, it, here's the essence of the Greco-Roman worldview. The universe is eternal. Well, if the universe is eternal, then the universe never actually came into existence. If the universe never came into existence, then how do we know anything about our existence here? Wow. So we believe that there is a God because like we'll see a tree and think, well, that tree must be sort of like a version of the perfect tree that exists in the realm of ideas. But how would we ever know? There has to be something that connects the two. Some people thought logic connects it. So we can use logical formula a logical formula, A, if A and B, therefore C, then we can use these formulae to understand the world. Others said, oh no, it's talk. Like the more we make arguments, yeah. then the more we will come to understand what is true. There were actually people in the Greco-Roman world who said there has to be some higher power, uh, some sort of a demigod, because otherwise we could never know what's ultimately out there. So when Jesus was called by John, the Logos of God, he was saying Jesus is the one yep. who connects what we know to be true in the world here and the world that is out there. And therefore, everything else we do in this world, including examining it to explore God's invisible nature, which brings glory to him, is something that we can do because of Jesus. Wow. What do you say to skeptics that say, uh, true freedom and true liberty will only come when we become more secular as a society. Uh, that that Christianity is oppressive, it's archaic, uh, and we somehow have to break free from the shackles of Christianity and embrace seculars. What do you say to people <laughs> like that? There is one worldview that has brought freedom rather than slavery in the history of the world and it is a Judeo-Christian worldview. Now, how is that? Because the Judeo-Christian worldview says that human beings are have a sin nature, that we need to have accountability, that no one gets in pow total power is gonna be good, 
they will be corrupt. Mm. That doesn't sound very positive. That sounds actually quite negative. And yet that worldview has brought more freedom and flourishing. What we need to understand is that freedom isn't just freedom from something, it's freedom for something. Mm. I remember Viktor Frankl, who was a concentration camp survivor, saying the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast should be supplemented by a statue of responsibility on the West Coast. Wow. Because liberty and responsibility all have to go together. Yep. And this was a characteristic of the teachings of Jesus. He said in John 8, 32, if you follow my teachings, you will be my disciples and you will know the truth, which actually he was using a Greek word that means reality. You will know reality and that understanding of reality will set you free. So that true freedom from things that would keep us from living freely and to do things that we were designed to do comes through Christ. Jeff, you are the president of Summit Ministries. Tell our audience a little bit about Summit and why you've committed your life to this. Uh, Summit Ministries equips and supports the rising generation. And we want them to do two things. We want them to embrace God's truth and we want them to champion a biblical worldview. One of the ways we do it is through these 11 day iconic events. We have them in Manitou Springs, Colorado at the foot of Pikes Peak and in Lookout Mountain, Georgia, overlooking the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And in these two programs, students will meet culture shaping, world changing thought leaders who are experts on all of the things that they have questions about, about God and about life and about purpose. When they come to the session, they hear from these individuals, then have the opportunity to personally interact with them. And then they meet in small groups and one-on-one and -on -one with mentors, all for the purpose of helping them arrive at an understanding of the truth. So that program's available for 16 to 22 year olds, and it has a huge effect on their lives. I mean, you work a lot with Gen Z students, and so you know that only 1% of Gen Zers have a biblical worldview in this country. By the time they finish 11 days at Summit Ministries, 95% say they have a biblical worldview. That's amazing. And then we keep studying them because you think, oh, well, of course, if you're coming back from camp, you're gonna be excited. Everybody's excited when they come home from camp. Yeah. But we study them one year, five years, 10 years out. Even at 10 years, 85% stay strong in their biblical worldview. So if you can help a young adult get the truth up front, then teach them how to grapple with the counterfeit worldviews that they might be facing and see how inadequate those counterfeit worldviews are, they can have an unshakable faith. Jeff, what you do is so critically important. I mean, we know, we know the studies, we know the research. The children that grow up in a home and a church that value worldview development exponentially decreases the chances that they walk away from their faith sometimes yes. during college. So thank you for your voice. Thank you for your ministry. Website. Website is summit.org. That's where you can find out about those 11 day experiences for young adults. Absolutely. And the book is phenomenal. Truth changes everything. Highly recommend it along with all of the other summit worldview curriculum uh, for students. So thank you so much for your ministry and for being on city of God. Yeah. Thanks Rob. And that's a wrap for City of God podcast. If you were encouraged and inspired by this episode with Jeff Myers of Summit Ministries, we pray that you would pass it along to family members, friends, or anyone who wants to explore today's hot button cultural issues all through the lens of God's word. Thank you once again for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on the City of God. The City of God podcast is produced by Coral Ridge Ministries and made in partnership with the Institute for Faith and Culture. Visit us at cityofgodpodcast.com to access all of our previous episodes. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, or anywhere you get podcasts. A full video version of this podcast is available on YouTube. This is the City of God Podcast, where Christ meets culture.